Hello and welcome to lecture 8 of our Introduction to Machine Learning course. Today we're going to talk about the boosting and the bagging. These, are, these were very hot topics in machine learning and statistics in the 90s and early 2000s, but still um, remain very popular and very useful algorithms until now. So to introduce these things, I will, I will start with this image that I used a lot in this course. So the bias variance trade-off depending on the model complexity we discussed it several times. Imagine some algorithm where you can change its complex, the model complexity. When you go from the, from the very simple models, the simple models underfit the data and show high bias. The test error is high. And then if you increase the complexity, you slowly get to the regime where the model complexity is so high that the model overfits your training data and the, vari the bias is low, but now the variance is high and the test error is high again. And somewhere in between is the, is the ideal, the sweet spot where you want to be. So the boosting and the bagging can be illustrated on this plot as follows. The boosting usually starts with a very simple model the model that underfits the data, that model that has high bias. And then we apply this boosting procedure. It can be applied to different models, increasing the model complexity and bringing the, the error down. Bagging, in contrast, starts with a very complex model, a model that overfits the data very, very badly. And then we bag several models together to reduce the variance and bring the performance um, uh, improve the performance again. So the, as I say here, the boosting builds complex models out of simple ones. It's a sequential procedure that boosts the model to make it more complicated, to make it more complex and reduce the bias. And the bagging averages complex models, hoping to average out the variance and, um, and also reduce the, the test error. So we'll start, um, we'll, I, I will start with introducing a particular model called classification trees because um, in fact, bagging and the boosting often use um, the particular kind of uh, particular kind of a classification model called called the classification tree. So let me introduce it here. Um, imagine you have a very simple data set like that with just two features, and it's a binary classification problem. So every point can belong to a circle class or the, the cross class. Um, in the classification tree, you try to find one feature that has high predictive performance. It can be thresholded such that all points below the threshold preferentially belong to one class and all points above the threshold preferentially belong to another class. And then if uh, the value of this feature is below the threshold, we'll just, in this case, for example, classify the point as a, as a circle. And if it's above the threshold, we can either just classify it as a cross or we can make the model more complicated and look for the next split. So here we can say if, the, if this is the case, then uh, we will make another split. And now we are looking at the second feature and if it's above the threshold, then it's a cross. And if it's below the threshold, then it's a circle. And in principle, one can keep building this tree. It's a binary tree because it always has two splits. So one can keep uh, adding, adding branches to it until you classify all the entire training set correctly and your training performance is 100%. You can always achieve that by building such a tree and it, it is built in a greedy manner. So we first look for the best possible split and this can be done relatively easily. You just look at each feature and like scan the possible thresholds and really brute force look for the, what is the best split. Uh, since you're always looking at one feature at a time, that's not very costly. And then once you found the split, you proceed to the next level and then you look for the second best split and so on. Um, so it's a, it's a greedy algorithm to build this tree. Okay, so that's all you need to know about the binary trees. Um, important thing here is that the, the size of the tree regulates model complexity in this case. So you can have the simplest possible tree that you can have just has one split here and nothing else. So it's one split and then everything on the left is classified as one class and everything on the right is another. This has a name, it's called a tree stump. Uh, it's of course a very, very simplistic model. On the other side of the spectrum, you have a fully grown tree. So that is a tree that achieves 100% training set accuracy. You, you, 
you, you cannot build a tree longer than that, so that's a fully grown tree. As another, sorry, as another remark, um, you can use trees for regression, that, that is called regression trees as opposed to classification trees, which work very similarly, but now in each of these uh, regions, you're just predicting a constant value if it's a regression problem. But here we're talking about classification problems today for simplicity, we only have two classes, so we'll just be predicting class one or class two. Okay, now in having introduced that, we can start to talk about boosting. The boosting, um, is a method that repeatedly applies a classifier. Usually it's a weak classifier. Um, so we will actually later on use tree stumps as, 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 as an example here. So you just take a tree stump, which is a very, very simple classifier with huge bias, and you repeatedly apply this classifier to your training set, but every time you modify the training set a little bit. In particular, you change the weights of specific samples. So let me, uh, let me introduce this algorithm to you in the very first, like the generic outline of the, of the boosting algorithm. So you start with all samples have the same weight. So this is, as, this is the same as not having weights at all. Then you apply your, um, your classifier to this uh, training data with these weights. So on the first iteration, you just apply the classifier to the data as, as the data set is. Um, and then you measure the performance of this data, so the accuracy on the training set, and depending on how well your algorithm performs, you will set the weight of, this, um, um, of, the, of the algorithm. If it performs very well, it will get a high weight. If it doesn't perform very well, it will get a lower weight. And then the most important thing is that we're going to look for examples that are misclassified by this algorithm. So if nothing is misclassified, then we're done, but usually you apply a very weak classifier, um, a lot of samples will be misclassified. We're looking at the ones that are misclassified and we increase their weights. Then we proceed to the second boosting iteration, we apply the same algorithm to the training set, but now the algorithm is forced to, to focus on these samples that were previously misclassified, okay? Um, so we build another model and then we increase the weights of the samples that are misclassified again, and we do keep doing this for 100 or 1,000 boosting iterations. So notice here that our models will not necessarily become better, like individual uh, models G, M, will not become better as we proceed. They will, instead, they will focus on different parts of the, of the, of the training set. So you first fit the model, some parts uh, it classifies correctly, some parts it misclassifies, then the algorithm focuses on these misclassified parts, um, classifies them correctly, but maybe misclassifies something that was previously classified correctly, and so on. So you will not, using this very weak classifier, you will not achieve a good performance for each individual model, but you will build a whole bunch of different models that cover different parts um, of the data, so to say. And then, the final result of the algorithm, the output, the, the resulting classifier, is actually the linear combination of all these boosted iterations. So we just combine all of these GM um, outputs with weights alpha that depend on the individual performance. It's just a linear combination. It's like the all, all uh, iterations vote, then um, if you have a test set, then on each uh, test case, all of these boosted uh, um, um, algorithms classifiers will, uh, will vote and the majority vote uh, with these weights will be the final classification. So this is a very generic scheme. Um, notice that you can use any classifier as the input here. Uh, let me illustrate it uh, on a very simple toy data. So here we again have two features and, and a binary classification problem. And let's say we use the tree stumps here now as, uh, as a weak learner. So here's the iteration one. This is the, the best tree stump. It performs not very well, but above chance, right? We classify all of that as, as circles and all of that as crosses. These points here get misclassified. So on the next iteration, I, I will draw them larger. This means they have an increased weight now. The algorithm is forced to classify, to, to pay attention to them. So the resulting, the resulting uh, tree stump will be different 
because the weights changed. So now maybe that is the optimal stamp. And now these things are all classified correctly together with these circles, but all of these crosses are now misclassified. So we increase their weight when we go to the third iteration and now fit another stamp and it will maybe be like that. So now all of that is classified as cross correctly, but these things are misclassified. And you can keep going. So this will n not, this will typically never converge in the sense that you will keep getting different, uh, different um, models as you go on. But then, of course, you stop uh, after some number of iterations and you do this averaging. So in this case, I just average the three models and if you look at them, um, you will see that here, for example, this model votes circle and this also votes circle and this votes cross, but it's two to one circle, so it's circle and so on. And I get the final decision boundary that is not linear um, and, and can be pretty complicated and the longer you boost, the more complicated decision boundary you can um, you can obtain in the final model. So it is the number of boosting iterations that regulates model complexity in this case. The most popular boosting algorithm is called Adaboost for adaptive boosting and it implements exactly the same logic as, as I had two slides before but what I didn't show on that slide is how we actually choose the alpha and how we choose these W weights, right? So the, the Adaboost is a particular way to um, to, um, to choose those weights. In order to, to introduce these weights, I need first to introduce this weighted accuracy. So on each, for each, on each given iteration, I can define the weighted accuracy of my classifier as follows. So here, this capital I uh, means it, it, it is one if the point is misclassified, so my predicted label is different from the actual label, then it's one, and if the predicted label is, is the same as the true label, then it's zero, and then I would just, if I just average uh, these zero, one values, I get the accuracy, but here I'm taking weights into account, so I get, I'm getting the weighted accuracy. And now I can define the adder boost, which just has a particular, particular choice for the, for the alpha weight depending on the error rate and a particular choice uh, for the W. So if you, if you pay attention to this formula here, um, let's do a sanity check. So if the error is very large, then what is large error? So large error means close to one, right? Then this will be close to, um, no, sorry, the, the very large error is actually 0 0.5 because you are we're doing binary classification, so if you're at a chance level, then your error is 50%, 0.5. So if you, if you plug 0.5 here, you get logarithm of one, which is zero, so it's zero weight, that makes sense. If your error is very low, this means it's close to zero, then this inside here will diverge to infinity, which means it will get an infinite weight, which makes sense if you are perfect um, on any one iteration, then this should get a very high weight. Um, so it's a sensible formula you will get weights between zero and very large depending on your performance. And here you see that everything that is, every sample that is misclassified increase, gets, um, gets the weight increased. So the formulas sort of make sense if you look at them like we did now, but they're also rather mysterious, like why these choices? I can write many different formulas that make sense here and um, they may be formed differently, like why this particular choice? So one perspective that I really like on, on Adaboost that actually appeared only a few years later after the uh, original algorithm was suggested is that actually we can see this entire thing as a greedy optimization of the exponential loss function. So let me explain what that means. Um, I can introduce this exponential loss function for my binary classification problem. So the yi's here are the true labels that can be minus one or one in this case. And these are my predictions. So if I predict the same label, this will be minus one and you will get one over e as a contribution to the sum. And if I predict a different label, for example, this is one and this is minus one, then I will get one inside the exponent, which means it will be E contribution to the sum. So every time I do a misclassification, I pay a price that is bigger. Um, so that makes sense. And then I sum over my entire training set, and this is my 
exponential loss. But G can also predict not necessarily one or minus one. Can in this case it can be predict um, any real value. And let's say we want to find the G that is a sum linear sum with some weights of of, of my classifiers here. And now let's say we want to optimize this exponential loss function um, by adapting the, this, these weights and choosing the, um, the individual GM terms in a greedy way. So that means first I find alpha 1 and G1, and I keep them fixed. And now I'm looking for the optimal G2 and alpha 2. And then I keep them fixed, and I proceed like that. So I'm like adding more and more terms to this expansion and every time I try to minimize the exponential loss function. So one can prove, and I'm not going to prove this in this lecture entirely, um, one can prove that this results in exactly the Adderboost procedure. So it's, it's just a different view of the Adderboost. The only thing I will show here, like I will start the proof, um, but not give it in full here, is that let's just take a look at what happens when we use this exponential loss function and we go from the model from m minus 1 terms to m terms. Like we do one iteration, right? So I can write this, this model as the sum of everything that I had before plus this new thing that I'm actually optimizing on this step, right? And since I have exponent of a sum, I can split it into two terms, and, and this is already fixed, so I can just call this the w, and this is what is actually allowed to be, changed, to be, to be fit on this iteration. So this, thanks to the exponential loss function, this weight here appears, and that's a sample weight, right? Uh, because it's a different WI for each of the samples. So starting with this, one can actually um, relatively straightforwardly derive the, that the optimal ways to choose, the, um, to choose these uh, alphas is the formula is the add a boost formula, and uh, the Ws will turn, turn out to be also given by the add a boost formulas. So this entire, the entire uh, add a boost machinery works thanks to the exponential loss function because it allows to, to split uh, basically thanks to this trick, right? So it's very neat. Um, in fact, it turns out that one can generalize that. One can use other loss function, not exponential loss function, um, but something else. Um, anything, in, actually anything you want. You say if it's a, uh, it can be the squared error loss function, it can be the, um, the same loss function we used in logistic regression. And then one can, you won't have add a boost anymore, but it's, it gets generalized to something called gradient boosting, which is a very, also a very useful family of algorithms. Then. All right, so some comments on Adaboost then um, to, to finish up this part. So first of all, it is often considered one of the best off-the-shelf classifiers. So off-the-shelf means you have some classification problem um, that is not like very, very domain-specific in the sense that maybe if it's a classification problem on the image data, then um, a convolutional neural network will perform much better than the Adaboost. If, if, the, if the data has some structure, like for example images, then there are other, other tools that, that may perform better. But if you are predicting something like, uh, something like um, I don't know, the apartment price based on, based on a bunch of different predictors, uh, none of which are images, um, then you will typically do a pretty good job if you use the Adaboost with, um, with tree stops as a classifier. So often in a situation where you have some classification problem and you just want to train something, don't want to spend a lot of time on fine-tuning that, um, you can use Adaboost. It's one of, the, one of the good choices. So number of boosting iterations, as I um, said before, controls the model complexity. The longer you boost, the more complex model you get. It can overfit, so in principle it's possible that you keep boosting and at some point your test error starts increasing again. However, the, the, the great thing is that it often it overfits very, very slowly, so you like boost for 100 iterations or 1,000, and even if it's already started over boost, overfitting, it will do this so slowly that you will not lose much in the performance, or 
in many cases, it actually does not overfit at all. So you keep boosting, and the performance just stabilizes the test performance and doesn't go up anymore. So that's pretty remarkable. We'll um, get back to that later um, in the end of the lecture briefly. Um, another comment is that if you boost for long enough, the training accuracy will get to 100%. So it can fit any training, for any training set, you can fit it perfectly if you boost long enough. Um, this whole treatment with exponential loss function shows that actually even after the training accuracy is already 100%, the algorithm won't stop, right? You can keep boosting even though your this aggregate model is already performing 100% on the training set, but the, the, iterate, the boosting iterations can keep going. Nothing will, nothing will stop them. Um, and the test uh, error can keep decreasing and the exponential loss on the training set can actually still keep decreasing um, even after the classification hits 100% uh, on the training set. So this shows that it actually really does optimize the exponential loss function and not just the misclassification. Um, all right, so let's then start with part two, which is the bagging. So the bagging stands for bootstrap aggregation. And in a way, it's simpler than, than boosting. It refers to model averaging, where we build a bunch of models and then just average them together. But we do not build them one like in this successfully, as, as, in, as in boosting, right? where the, we need to keep track of the weights and everything. But we just completely, completely parallelizable, independently build a bunch of models and then average. So that's simpler. Um, and we build these models on, on bootstrapped data sets. So we, we take our data set, then we draw bootstrap copies of it, samples of it, we build our model, and then we average them. So what, what does bootstrap data set mean? You might have encountered this, this term in statistics. It's a very useful concept. Um, bootstrapping refers to drawing samples with repetitions. Um, where you draw the same number of samples as you originally had. So let's say you had 1,000 samples in your training data. If you want to make, if you want to do bootstrapping, you draw 1,000 samples out of these 1,000 samples, but you allow repetitions. So sev some samples will be selected two times, three times, four times. Some samples, by chance, will not get selected at all. Um, so you will get a sample that contains some repetitions, uh, but it will have the same size as your original sample, right? It will still have 1,000 1, samples. So that's often very useful uh, in statistics in different con uh, contexts. Here, um, we'll just use these bootstrapped samples to build the model. So the intuition is that we have our sample, we'll change it slightly by having like one bootstrapped sample, another bootstrapped sample, the third bootstrapped sample, and then every time we'll build a model, um, they will all be a bit different because the samples are a bit different, and then we will average. So one comment on the bootstrapping procedure, one can show um, as an exercise that on average you will select, you will leave out um, around one third of the samples, one over E samples will be left out on each bootstrap iteration, and this is around 30%. So two thirds of your samples will get on average into each bootstrap iteration is different two thirds every time, of course. So the bagging is, the idea of bagging is to apply it to the models that have low bias and high variance, okay? For example, a fully grown tree. So if you build a fully grown classification tree, you will achieve training set 100%. You will often have a lousy test error because you overfit your training data you are in a high variance situation. But the bias is very low, maybe even zero. So the hope here is that if you build a bunch of these models and then average, and if the bias was zero for each of them, it will stay zero. So you will not, you will not, um, the bias will not uh, change, but the variance will go down thanks to this averaging. That is the hope of the bagging. And then if the variance decreases and the bias stay low, our model um, will perform better than each individual model. In fact, if every model were independent, 
then the variance would even decrease to zero. So if you increase the sample size and all, all terms are independent, then the variance of the result will just go to zero. And you will have perfect model. Of course, in reality, this will not happen because the models are not independent because they are built on the bootstrapped, um, bootstrapped samples of your data set. So it's not new data right? That, that, that you use to build each successful um, model. It's, it's different data set but it overlaps with the previous one. So they are not independent, so the variance will not go to zero, but it will hopefully decrease. This is not random forest yet. This is just general bagging procedure. Random forest makes one uh, important um, tweak, and that is the aim is to decrease this dependency between, um, between every two models, between every pair um, of backed models. So how can we do that? We, we want, the idea is that we want to make every, every two models, we want to make them a little bit more different than what we get by applying them to two bootstrapped samples. And here's how the random forests um, do that. We, uh, so random forest specifically refers to fully grown, uh, to fully grown classification trees. It's a forest of trees. Um, so now when we build our tree on, on a given iteration, on a given bootstrapped sample, we start building the tree. And then, remember, we build the tree greedily by doing these binary splits, right? So every time we do a split, we actually select a subset of variables that can be candidate, um, candidates for, for splitting. And then we check those and choose the best one and make the split. So we don't scan all variables, but just a subset. And it can be a small subset. Um, and this introduces additional randomness. So this will make the trees more different from one another, and then will hopefully allow the variance to decrease uh, further. It's just a heuristic, but turns out it works pretty well. This will perform better, um, sometimes much better than just bagging without this tweak. So important comment is that here, Unlike what we had before in Adaboost and in boosting, the number of trees do not really regulate model complexity in, in any meaningful way. So the number of trees here just, um, if you keep adding trees, you're just keeping the terms into your, into your big average. Um, the idea is that you choose the number that is, that is relatively big to decrease the variance. So maybe you choose like a thousand trees, for example. Um, but by doing this longer, your model will not necessarily become more um, or less um, complex. It will converge to something uh, and then stay there. Whereas in, um, in boosting, you like keep increasing the complexity with every, with every subsequent iteration. So some comments on random forests now. They are also often considered one of the best off-the-shelf classifiers. They are, they are very easy to to implement, to build, to use, um, and often are one of the one of the um, you know, top recommendations to what you can use if you need a, a classification algorithm. They actually, in practice, tend to perform similarly well to to Adaboost or gradient boosting in in general. The good thing is that random forest requires very little tuning. There's almost no free parameters, right? There's a free parameter of how big the tree is, but random forest usually uses fully grown trees. Um, there's another free parameter of this, how, how many variables you, you scan on each, on each uh, split, but usually the performance also weakly depends on that. You, you go with the default value, and then there's nothing to tune anymore. There's no really a regularization parameter to tune. You just let it run, and miraculously it performs well. Um, important remark is that typically you will get 100% training set accuracy with a random forest. And this is, may not be entirely obvious immediately, so why is that? And that is because uh, remember that two-thirds of your samples will, on average, get into um, each bootstrapped tree. Each tree is fully grown, so has 100% training set accuracy. Now, if you look at each training sample, it will, by the same logic, appear in two-thirds, in the training sets of two-thirds of the trees. And they all have 100% training set accuracy. So the aggregate model, the 
uh, like the, when, when these trees vote for every uh, training set samples, two thirds of them will vote correctly um, or more. And so you will get, you will perfectly classify all training set examples. So you're in, it seems you're in an overfitting regime, right? You are, um, whatever the training data is, you will reach 100% training set accuracy. Nevertheless, test set performance can be, can be pretty good. Um, two more things that are specific for, for random forest and are useful, often useful in practice. One thing is that it doesn't really require a validation set or a test set or a cross-validation procedure. And that's because when you're building the forest, you naturally have the samples that are left out when you're building each tree, right? The special term in random forest literature is out of the bag samples. So you have this one third of samples that don't, that are not used to train each tree. So um, you can, for each sample in your, in your data set, you can average only trees that came from bootstrap iteration where, the, where this particular sample was not selected where this sample was out of bag, um, and then you average the performance only over those trees, and this acts as a test set, right? So you don't have a separate test set, but for each sample, you can only look at trees that didn't use this sample to build the trees, and then it acts as if it were a test set. So, and you don't, you, you, you get it for free, because you're using this, bootstrapping procedure anyway when you build a random forest. And once you're done, you have this out-of-bag estimate of the performance, which is as good as having a test set. So that's pretty convenient. And another thing is that you can use a very similar trick to assess variable importance, which is, which is often useful. You have a bunch of predictors, you're predicting something, and then you want to know which, which variables um, actually contributed a lot to, uh, to the performance. And you can do this very, very easily here when you're using this, um, when you're using these out of bag samples to check the performance of the random forest, you can permute one variable at a time. So just scramble one variable at a time and then check the performance. And if there's a variable that where the performance decreases a lot when you scrambled it, um, then this means that was an important variable. So this is, this is pretty standard in, in random forest literature. In, in applications, if you see random forest used in, in a scientific paper, you will often see also um, a plot that shows um, the variables sorted by importance, and this is how the importance is, is, is typically assessed. So we're almost done. Um, as, as, as closing remarks, I want to get back to this um, figure that I had in the beginning that shows the bias variance trade-off depending on the model complexity, right? And then it is, it is tempting to think about the boosting as starting somewhere here and then increasing the model complexity until you get to somewhere here, to the sweet spot, and the bagging or the random forest is start somewhere here, and then you average the models and you actually decrease the model complexity until you also get to the sweet spot. So this is, I think, a wrong image. This is not what is happening here, because as we discussed, actually both are examples of interpolating classifiers, so classifiers that fit the training set perfectly. This means that both of them are in, 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 in this interpolating regime. So we, we talked about that earlier um, in lecture four, I think, one can imagine even more complex models behind, behind the interpolation threshold here on the right. And remember when we talked about regression and when we talked in particular about neural networks in the previous lecture, we, we talked about this double descent phenomenon where um, the models can be so complex that they fit any training set perfectly, but nevertheless the test error um, is good thanks to some implicit regularization. And this is one property. Uh, of the neural networks that attracts a lot of attention here. But uh, in, 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 in recent years, similar things happen here in both cases. So in random forests, your training set performance is 100% by construction. Nevertheless, 
your variance decreases and you actually end up with good test error. So you are at the interpolation or you are on the other side of the interpolation threshold. And the um, same happens here or even more interesting thing happens here with boosting where you start, if you start, if you're using the weak learners, you start here on the left and then you, you, you boost and boost and boost and your model complexity increases and if you boost long enough, your training set performance is at 100%, which means you are now, you crossed the interpolation threshold. You are now somewhere here in this regime. But usually what will happen, or often what will happen, is that you basically, you, uh, you like tunnel through this, through this high variance peak. You, you never see it when you boost. So your, your performance improves, and then you somehow get, go from here to here, thanks to some implicit regularization uh, that operates in boosting, and then you end up with this model that, that lies beyond the interpolation threshold on, a, um, on the bias variance trade-off. So there are relatively recent papers that, that study this phenomenon. I, my impression is that it's not fully understood why and in what, why this happens, how this happens, in what exact situations it happens and in what doesn't. Um, so this is actually a very interesting and active field of research. Um, it also nicely shows that there's, there's a lot of discussion in the literature now about why this happens in, in neural networks, why the neural networks are in this uh, atypical um, interpolating regime but nevertheless perform well. Well, in fact, these two, um, two models from the 90s, the Adaboost and the Random Forest, they um, we see similar phenomenon, phenomena there too. These are interpolating classifiers that nevertheless often perform really well, um, uh, have ha on, on a test date, have really good uh, predictive performance. Thank you.